So my, my goal with this wasn't to get bogged down in too much detail. Um, most of the programming that I've taught um, was for other consultants when I worked at big companies. And so I, I thought that my uh, first weakness would be to get, get into too much detail and lose everybody. Um, at the consulting companies, I have the advantage that, that they would fire anyone who failed my classes, so people were highly motivated not to get lost. Hey, um, you mean we're not motivated? <laughs> yeah. So we can go into more depth, but my, my original plan was to not. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to, to cover is, all right, the, the weakness with, with these modern windowing operating systems is you have all these shortcuts, and they look very similar, but they can do completely different things depending on what the shortcut points to. Um, now the classic sort of circa Windows 3.1 or the original Mac thing that happens when you click a shortcut would be that it executes a program that's on your computer. But currently, you have other types of shortcuts that could also send a request to a completely separate computer that sends you back the results. That's typically displaying a web page. Um, and then it could also send a request to another computer that sends you a program that then runs on your, your computer. And now the plus that I put in there is actually on the request is actually fairly important for security um, and marginally important for the programs. What the plus is, is all sorts of your personal data that it's saved on your hard drive. And that's typically um, saved in little text files called cookies. Um, and it's how sites remember things about you. Um, now, if this is a site that you wanted to remember things about you, like your Yahoo homepage, that's great, because what it does is it sends your personal data up to Yahoo, and the program that's running on Yahoo's computer reads your personal data and knows that you want to see the weather but not the stock ticker. Um, where it's not so great is people who want to do things you'd prefer they didn't, like track all the sites you go to and then sell that information, also save these things on your hard drive. And that's where you get a lot of spyware and other security issues these days, is that little plus. Um, too early for a question. Go ahead. You know, you look at these cookie files and they look like little tiny text things, look like email addresses. It's hard to imagine that that existing on your hard drive would allow someone to like track wherever you go. Well, what what they'll typically do in in the in the bad case, what they'll typically do is install a program that saves some information every time you go to a web page. So it updates the little the little file every time you click an internet link. Um, so it just makes a list, and then it sends the list periodically up. Um, but yeah, it can, it can do other things. I'll, I'll go into a bit more depth. Um, so now, we've already started on the first point, and that's the security implications are clearly very different, because if you've installed a program and you're running it, you, you more or less know what it does. Whereas if you're downloading a program from someplace else and running it, um, you, you really have no idea what that program is doing. So they've built in limitations um, into the languages people use for that, for that reason. Um, Microsoft originally came up with a technology that had very few limitations, with the idea that you could make very powerful internet programs. But the problem was people used it for all sorts of vile things, and that was ActiveX. And the, the problem with that was entirely they didn't limit it enough, and people did all sorts of nasty things with it. Um, the security implications also cut the other way. As a writer of a program, you might not want people to have all your data. And if you write your web application in such a way that the, the program runs on the client's machines, there are clients who are also not wonderful people who will break into your program and steal all that data. Um, whereas if it's all on your server, it's much harder. Um, the second comes to if, if you have a program that you use a lot that runs very slowly, um, if it's a program that's actually running over the, the network, typically the reasons it's running slowly have more to do with the networking than your local computer. And I've seen people buy new computers, which didn't help them at all, running 
what, what they were running slowly because they thought their computer had some problem, but it was actually their internet connection was slow and the program they were running depended on the internet connection. Um, I touched on the languages too, and that's if you want to make, make such a program, if you want to make a program that people are going to run locally on their computer, that's a very different environment, and the languages are very different than a program that's going to run on your server, or, or yet again, a program that people are going to request from your server and then run locally. And part of the reason for that is this last point, and that's they have to have different limitations. If you have a program that's designed to run locally on your computer, you give it all the power you can, because why limit yourself? Um, if you don't want to do something nasty, you don't, and that's it. But if you have an environment that's designed for people to come to a server and then run a program on their local computers, you clearly have to put in some consideration for what the program can then do to that other person's computer. Otherwise, no one will trust it enough to, to run such programs. Okay. And the, the first example I had was just of shortcuts. Um, and again, Anyway, I had three, one of each type, that I'd saved that all looked very similar. Ah, it got through. And just to show you how similar, I used the same, the same exact site. The first example, which my settings are too large for, is a little charting application. And you save, you save your settings, and then you click this button to update. And that's the hallmark of something that's running on the server. That's the downside, is that the user interface is kludgy, because you have to, um, every time you want to interact with the program, you have to then send something to the computer, so there's a lot of extra button clicks, which aggravate people. Um, now, if I do this, and it looks very similar, see how this little Java symbol is coming as the chart is loading? And now I can interact with the program um, in real time without clicking a button and having it refresh the screen. The reason for that is what it's actually done is it's downloaded a program to my computer along with data. And it's, this is now running on my computer. It's connected to their website, but it's not the same at all as the previous chart that looked almost identical. Because now I've got a program running inside my browser here locally that's just drawing data from their internet site. So if I didn't trust this site, that could be unfortunate for me, or if this data had a lot of value to them, that could be unfortunate to them, because I could clearly, if this program has all this data and it's running on my computer, with some effort, I could take all their data. Now, granted, this is publicly available quote data, so it's not worth very much to them, but there are people who give a lot of effort to trying to uh, get around the fact that um, when it's running on someone's computer, they have full control over it. So there's a lot of tricks people play with encryption and all sorts of fancy things trying to get around that fact. But what really, uh, what really is the problem is that if it's running on their computer, in the end, they have full control. Whereas it's, if it's running on your server, in the end, you have full control. So, um, a lot of the work in making internet programs is actually preventing people from doing things that they, strictly speaking, can't do. Um, so now, depending on what, what you want to do, there's also um, 
different environments that are most productive to do it in. So basically, if you're going to write a program, you, you have to have some problem you're trying to solve. Otherwise, why go through the effort, right? So one type of program is you could do something by hand, say rename a file or something simple like that, but you want to do it thousands of times, and you don't want to do it by hand thousands of times. So that's what we call a batch program, and that's a very typical type of thing you want to write some sort of program to do. It's just you want to automate some tasks you can do by hand. Um, you might want to write a, a local program that you'll use on your own computer that has a user interface. Um, you might want to write a program that has a graphical interface that runs over the internet. Um, it's a web page. It basically runs on your server, but the display is remote. Or you can write a program like the little chart I just displayed that runs, that people <coughs> request from your server, and then it runs on their, their computer. And those are sort of um, very different end goals, which require different um, methods for you to efficiently do them. Now, people get very aggravated with programming languages because everyone has their favorite, and they sort of see the world through that filter. So I wanted to start out by saying, yes, you can absolutely do things that do not um, that are not focused on the particular environment you're programming for. Um, and these two examples I've actually seen at companies. Um, I worked at an insurance company where they had an entire order processing system written just with DOS batch files. But the amount of brain power they had put into that order processing system, they could have sent the damn thing to the moon and back. Um, whereas if they'd used a decent server-side programming language, it would have been about two weeks' effort. And similarly, if a person only knows how to use Java and they want to process a whole bunch of huge text files, they can do that too, even though Java really wasn't designed for that. Um, and the nice thing is Java is a nice, clean programming language. It'll be a beautiful script, but it will never run fast no matter how clever they are because it wasn't designed to do that. Um, and the reason I, I called this driving nails with a screwdriver is it really is the sort of thing where the end result is okay. You have this thing and it runs okay. It's just the amount of effort you have to put in is very different. Whereas driving screws with a hammer, well, it isn't too much extra effort, but in the end you have a big mess. And so that, that's sort of the, the distinction in most programming languages is you can get there, you get the same end result, it's just you've busted your butt way more than the result shows. Um, as a consultant, this is great because you can look like a genius very easily just by switching to an appropriate tool and going forward. Now the first thing I wanted to cover, because it's the most common for, for non-professional programmers, is that, that first category where I've got some repetitive task I want to do. I have 300 files and my stupid MP3 ripper named them all wrong. And now I want to rename them all. Well, that could take me hours of right clicking. So typically writing a little script to do it is, is quicker. Um, these languages used to be strictly for this. They used to be strictly for I have something I want to do a thousand times type of tasks. I did want to mention they're growing. Um, the, the, the range of things being done with these scripting languages is now incredibly huger than it used to be, and primarily this is because of the speed of computers. What I used to have to go and, and go into low-level programming for, people now can do in a script and it runs fast enough, and since it's simpler to write it, um, people are, and then they've expanded the capabilities of the languages um, at the same time. So I just quickly went through the, the four, what I see as the most common ways of scripting. Now the first, the first is the way everybody used to script, and that's a shell script in whatever, whatever environment you're in. And a shell script is like in DOS where you go, um, 
rename, star.bat, star.bat. That's a simple script. Um, Unix shells have more power. Um, the reason I put Sigwin in parentheses is that's, that's a portable environment that lets you run Unix shells on different operating systems that aren't designed for it. Now, you OS X people have this power built into your operating system. You can just switch shells. But for the Windows or, or other operating system people, they tend to need another environment to help them along. Um, the problem with these is that they, the languages don't have a lot of power. So again, it's a lot of effort. And every new computer you go to typically requires that you learn a new shell. Um, so the default shell on Windows and on different versions of Linux and on Mac is different. And learning a new shell language is annoying. Perl was designed to get around this. And it's, it's been around for many, many years. And what it basically was was a uh, system admin said, why do I have to keep learning a different scripting language for every new type of computer that I use? I'm going to write one scripting language that's going to run everywhere. And Perl runs literally on everything, um, from mainframes all the way down to Palm Pilots and everything in between. And it's not a particularly pretty language, but since it runs everywhere and it's very flexible, it gets used as duct tape. Typically, any large website you ever go to, um, even if the website itself doesn't use any Perl whatsoever, there's some scripts around that, okay, when I want to change the header, I need something that goes through 3,000 files, searches them all out, and changes the header there'll be a Perl script in there to do that. There'll be little maintenance scripts on large database sites. And typically, if you ask the, the guy in charge of the site, they won't even know. They'll say, no, no, we're not using that. If you ask the guys doing the work, they'll say, oh, yeah, we have all these scripts that when we have to do our backups, they do all this stuff, and they move the stuff to the remote site, and, and uh, we wrote it in Perl because we only had two weeks. And so it's, it's a lot more common than it appears. Um, Python was a response um, to the fact that Perl is nasty. Um, and it, it's very, um, very much German engineering. All the interfaces are exactly crisp. They all work the same way. Everything is clean and neat and orderly. Um, and it has about the same power as Perl does now um, because of people who were sick of dealing with messiness wanted everything to be neat. Now in Windows, um, the latest versions, they've given additional power to JavaScript and VBScript that other scripting languages don't have. Um, so people use them for writing local scripts just because it's a bit easier to get at the Windows um, interfaces. Um, but they're really not intended for this. And so I, I always think of it as languages that were intended for the internet misapplied to local scripts. They're not really good as scripting languages. And I'll, I'll get back to what they are good for. Nothing against the languages. Well, nothing against JavaScript. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the use of them, if you have a lot of local tasks to do, is, is one of those that are a bit inappropriate. And because I'm doing my example in Perl, which is why I highlighted it in red, I, I threw in a slide about Perl in specific. And because it's been around so long, it has some advantages over other languages. And that's, it runs everywhere, and it's easy to do internet type of things. For instance, I'll show you one script that um, gets information off of Amazon. And that type of script is very easy to write in Perl and very hard to write from scratch. Um, typically. Um, it's also very, very fast and can deal with any, any sort of file that you'll ever come across. And it's got, um, it's got many, many pre-written programs available for it. The downside is it's only really easy to use if you were an old Unix power user. I'll, I'll admit that up front. And that's it has, its syntax is intended to be easy for people who knew how to use set and awk and all those old Unix programs, um, which typically isn't 
the um, the power user of today. Um, I've, I've just listed some sites for people people interested in scripting. I'm sure we can dump the page somewhere. So um, typically that's how I do things is I don't remember how to get to everything. So now the first the first program here is a Perl script I wrote that renames things. Um, and what it looks like on the inside, everything is so small in this resolution. I gotta apologize. I'm used to working in four times the resolution, so everything isn't scaled down. That's better. Um, and what it does is it it loops through every file using typical DOS star dot whatever. Um, and then renames it according to some pattern. This is what it's coming from, and this is what it's going to. Now, the advantage of this over a blank rename is that there's a lot more power here. Um, the disadvantage is it's harder to understand. So, for instance, this top line, if I uncommented this, what it would do is it would take the all all the um, uppercase letters would remember them and it would add a space and it was a particular group of files where there was a uppercase section in the name and it was all mushed together with the the rest of the name and I wanted to space it out and the dollar sign one is the the first section that it captured and I find I, I do a lot of stuff like this where I just wanna I have say again the title of the song and I want to pull that out because it's unique, but it has some other crap I don't want. So just pull that section of the file names out, which are unique. Save that in the new name and put something else in there. And that's what I wrote this script for. Now you can see the disadvantage in that in operation, it's dead simple. I double click it, it renames all the files. In um, To maintain it though, you have to know Unix regular expression syntax, which isn't isn't intuitive to most people. So um, here's another script I wrote, and the reason I wrote it was because I drag and drop the uh, the names of books typically into folders, and then I've got all these book names um, from Amazon. But the way Amazon makes the name when you when you do that really aggravates me because I know it's an Amazon shortcut. I know it's a book because I put it in my folder of books I'm interested in buying. I don't care to have every file name there. And what I do care is the author. Um, so I wrote a script that takes this shortcut, reads it, and it goes out to Amazon's site, figures out what the author's name is, and it writes me a new shortcut with the author's name and the title. And then it goes and it does the same thing on the Amazon Japan site, because the Amazon Japan site has a lousy search engine. And I can never find the equivalent book without copying and pasting the ISBN number, which also aggravated me. It was something I did enough. And again, to use it is dead simple. And I end up with a, with a folder full of author, author title. Um, which again, and then this, the same folder full of author title that just points to the Japanese Amazon site instead of the American Amazon site. Um, the weakness is, of course, the maintainability. And it's, it's doing a lot of things. The key of it, really, is just no, another one of these little while loops where it goes and it reads all the files, then it reads all the lines out of the files, it finds the URL, it goes up there, it extracts the info, and then it, it prints the uh, prints the info into new files. The mechanics of it are pretty simple, but it's the type of thing that takes a lot of getting used to. For instance, in Perl, all the the variable names 
have dollar signs, and that tells you things. Um, and it's simple enough to get you URLs. That's the line that does all the, the internet networking. All the hard part that if this was, say, a, a C program, would take me days to figure out. I say, go get the page. And it goes and gets the whole page and brings it back to me in a text file, which is actually miraculous in a way for what it, for the power that it has. Have I now killed my... Oh, sorry again. There I am. Oh, and I also, I included a shell, if people are, are interested, um, particularly you Mac people, you have Unix shells built in now. Um, and there are a lot of, there's more power in a Unix shell than in a DOS batch window. So for, if people are um, not used to that, it might be hidden from you, the fact that you have so much power, and I, I thought, I'm not going to go a lot into shell scripting, because as, as nasty as the Perl example was, it's actually a lot nastier when you write programs in shell script. However, I, I wanted to briefly mention that there is that power there. Um, and what do I have? Okay, I have... Uh, That wasn't a very good one. My shell scripts tend to be very much like this. They tend to be similar to bash files. Um, in that I'm just executing things in other languages, but that's because all my all my real shell scripts are in Perl. Um, the features of a shell script that are most important is this very first line. And this, for instance, the Macs include five, five shell scripting languages by default. And if you write a shell script, it will run unpredictably depending on what people have set their default shell to. Same with Sigwin for Windows. There are different shells built in. So this first line tells it which shell to use. And then it's just like sort of like a batch file in that it'll, it'll go through and execute the lines one after the other. And you can do simple loops. And you can do simple, um, simple programming type of stuff with it. But I typically recommend people learn Perl if they're interested in scripting, just because you only have to learn it once, and then you have all that power. Uh, now I'm back at the beginning. Pardon me while I zoom through this. OK. Now, the second group of programs are um, when you're writing local programs. And the key is that a local graphical program gets complicated very quickly. Um, because you never know what order your user is going to do things in. So you have to react to the user robustly. And it gets big fast. Any sort of complicated system, though, um, benefits from while you're writing it, you break it up into little pieces, and then you have the little pieces talk to each other. Because um, it helps to keep it in your head. The, the limit, especially on programs that users interact with, is how much of the program you can keep in your head at one time while you're writing it. And all the object-oriented languages, all that really is, is a trick to help you break up the program into little pieces so that you have less to keep in your head at one time. And if the little pieces just talk to each other in a predefined way, while you're working on one little piece, you don't have to have all the others in your head at the same time. Now, example, examples of this are Java. Beautiful program running on the server, if you're, say, doing web pages. Um, it runs... Sun's original advertising line is write once, run everywhere. The problem is it runs poorly everywhere. It's um, typical of a general use part. If you're writing Java programs that run on the client, it depends on a lot of things on the client, how they're set up. And so it tends to crash a lot. There'll be a lot of people that won't be able to run it. It depends on how they have things that 
end users typically don't think about like their system path set, which is very difficult for you to fix from within Java. Um, C Sharp was basically Microsoft saying, you know, Java is a really good programming language, but it doesn't work well on the client. And originally, what they tried to do was steal Java and then make it run well on Windows with their own version of Java. And then Sun sued them. So they made C Sharp, which is Java, with the name changed so that it's harder to sue them. Um, and then it accesses the Windows base classes. And currently on Windows, this is the easiest language for writing graphical programs. Um, you can make a program that, say, accesses a database and makes graphs or does other local things in probably a quarter to a tenth of the time. Uh, VB, they have currently in the same framework that they have C Sharp. Um, VB used to be the only way to do this on Windows, realistically. That's Visual Basic. Visual Basic. Um, they've, from the older versions of VB to the current version, they've changed it enough so it really is learning a new language anyway. And because C Sharp is cleaner because they stole Java from Sun instead of trying to make their own Microsoft language, um, I recommend if, if anyone, unless they were a real hardcore VB person, if they used to like VB, they'll probably like C Sharp better. So rather than going from VB6 to VB.net, I'd, I'd recommend jump to C Sharp just because it's cleaner. Um, Ruby on Rails is, a, is another one of those scripting languages that's sort of grown up. And now the, the Rails framework is a new, new contender in the realm of writing local graphical user interface programs very quickly. And the nice thing about all these scripting languages is it's not just Windows or just Mac. Um, and I included a, a resource page here. The trouble with Googling a lot of these things is you get a very low signal noise ratio. Um, you get thousands of sites from people who love these languages, and most of them are marginally useful. Um, so I, I've sort of pruned it down here. Um, I might have pruned it too much, but these are my these are my best links on these. Um, on Java, Java.com is Sun's site where you can download all the software you need to write Java for free. And the best, the absolute best tutorial for Java is the second site, it's a fellow who wrote, um, when he wrote his book, he published it for free on the internet. And what he found was it didn't really detract from the sales of his book at all, because people don't want to download an 800 page PDF and then print it at home. They would prefer to just buy the book. But it's a great book um, called Thinking in Java. Um, if you're starting from scratch learning Java, that's the place to start. Um, anything Microsoft, if you're ever doing any Windows programming, you've got to have an MSDN subscription. It's table stakes. Um, the MSDN site is your source for all information programming on Windows. Going anyplace else is really a waste of time. Um, and I included the, the Ruby links just because I had mentioned that. Okay. So. This will be very, very familiar to anyone who's a old VB programmer. Yep. You basically, you want a button, you make a button. You want a text box, you make a text box. Now, the nice thing about it is that, all right, I've got a text box called text box one. Let's say I want to make this, this program actually do something. If I was writing this in one of the other options, say Java or C++ or C, um, this is a lot of work to, to get these things, now that I have them, to actually do anything. But now, this is as simple as, okay, when someone clicks the button, I want, say, text box one, which is my text box, and I want the text of it, text equals
and then we've got a program that does something. Now, that if you haven't written this type of program, that probably doesn't seem like much, but the fact that you can get to the point where you have a running user interface with, you know, about 10, 15 minutes more work, we could have it with menus that did things and other things. The fact that you can get to that point in a few minutes and not waste your time on that, spend all your time on what you actually want your program to do is a miraculous benefit to writing user interface programs. Because that user interface code, like I said, that, that actually reacts to what the user is doing is really a pain in the neck. Getting the menus so that when someone clicks the menu, it actually does it right and stuff is actually used to be a tremendous amount of work when we did Windows and, and Mac user interface programming in C++. Doing it in Java, the problem is there isn't a slick way to do the part that I just did and have it run reliably. And that's the making a window, spacing out the controls. They, they have a very robust language for that, but it's, it's very labor intensive you end up, um, end up spending a lot of your time on it. You can tell I don't do many presentations because I don't know how to jump to the middle of the thing. Okay, so now, if I'm in the, the web world, um, I've got those two type of programs, the ones that run on my server and the ones that are automatically downloaded to the client's computer and run there. Um, now, the leading ways to do it on my server, um, if I have a big, say, say I was writing a banking <coughs> site, I can use HTML plus Java, which are called Java server pages. Um, and this is a really good way to write a reliable website because Java, the thing that it was most intended for was to make it easy for programmers to write reliable programs. So it has all sorts of great features for making your programs well organized and reliable. And since it's running on your server, the fact that it's very finicky about its environment is irrelevant. If it takes you a week to figure out the environment, well, you figure it out once, and then your server runs great from then forevermore, and the clients don't have to care. Whoever's running the program just runs it across the internet and they don't care that the environment was fussy on your server. All they get on their end is the output. Um, the second was PHP. And what PHP is basically was an easier way to embed a Perl-like scripting language into your HTML. So it's for people who know HTML well and just want to add little programs to their website. So you have a whole website written in HTML, and then you say, instead of me coding this every day, I'd like it to pull this section of the text from my database so that I wouldn't have to fuss with the news headlines. It would just pull the news headlines out. So you can be coding your web page in HTML and then just basically plop in a, and get the data out of the database and put it here, tag, in your HTML. Um, it's become very popular because for people who know websites and don't know much programming, it's more or less the simplest way to make a reliable website. And it's got a lot of nice features for very simply password protecting simple sections of your site, very simply getting data, that type of thing. Um, if your web server is in the Microsoft world, um, the very same programming environment I showed you for local programs can be used to code web pages. Um, and you can put either VB or C Sharp in web pages and that's called Active Server Pages, or ASP. Um, this used to really suck, because it used to use only VB script instead of real VB. And um, VB script is a significantly enough um, watered down version of VB that this made it very painful to make large websites that were maintainable in ASP. Um, so people typically would go ASP because it was simple to program in, in VB. And then when their site got to a certain size, they would call someone like me and I would say, okay, so now you have a prototype for the website you would like. We don't take any of that code. 
I know you spent a lot of money on it. So sorry. Throw it all out. Now that we're writing this, this website using entirely different tools, we'll be able to make it big and run fast. Um, well, they they more or less fixed that. Now that you can use real programming languages in ASP, it runs just about as well as the others. The only limitation or advantage, depending on your side of the religious divide, being that your web servers will always be Microsoft web servers. What about this one, ChiliSoft? Is that the Linux version of ASP? Right. They they have they have that. They also have a Mono project. Um, which is a Linux version of .NET. Um, if I'm on Linux, the advantages of writing something in ASP go away very quickly. The big advantage of ASP is that fantastic Microsoft programming environment. The one thing Microsoft has got spot on is they realize if we're evil to the people trying to write programs for our operating system, they won't write programs for our operating system we won't have cool programs on our operating system, we'll sell less of our stuff too. So they've always treated the programmers who want to write programs for Windows really well. So typically, Microsoft's programming environments where you write programs to run on Windows, as long as you're in the world where your programs are just going to run on Windows, they're fantastic. That um, Visual Studio programming environment is half again as easy as most of the others. Now, there's Linux programming environments like Eclipse um, that are very productive, but they're written for Linux people. I would say if you're on Linux, bite the bullet, learn Java. Because all the Linux guys who write Eclipse and all the Linux programming environments, um, they hate Microsoft. So they don't make it easy for you to write Microsoft stuff. They make it easy for you to write Java or C. Um, so go along with them. They're the, they're the guys making your life easier. So, for instance, if, you, if you're running an Apache web server on Linux, it's very much easier to get Java or Perl CGI or PHP running than it is to get ASP running, and it runs better. Whereas if you're on a Microsoft web server, yeah, you can run Java on a Microsoft web server, but Java doesn't want you to be able to do that easily, so therefore, you spend your life fighting Java instead of writing your program. Um, whereas if you're on a Microsoft web server, you should just give up and say, <laughs> I'm on a Microsoft web server. Let me write in a language that Microsoft likes because they will make my life easy. And simple, if you're writing, if you're on a Microsoft web server, if you're writing in C Sharp, the, the effort it takes for you to get that C Sharp program running on your web server is clicking the button in Visual Studio that says, send this program to my web server, and poof, and it works perfectly. Whereas if you're writing it in Java, that's three or four days of hard labor the first time, and then two hours every time after that to get it to, get it to run properly. Well, it's not really worth it. Um, the old way we used to do this type of program, the reason why websites say, in 1995 didn't tend to be as slick as they are now, um, was people in the Unix world had Perl. It was their duct tape already. So they said, well, I can write a Perl program that writes text files. I know how to do that. And HTML files are text files. And web pages are just HTML files. So they wrote monstrous Perl programs, the output of which was HTML files that would be delivered to the browsers. And this is CGI. Now the problem with this is if you hire an internet guy, a web page designer, they will not be able to maintain this type of program because they're used to coding in HTML and there's no HTML there. There's just a monstrous Perl program. The HTML is the output. So when you hire some guy to advise you on, say, how you're navigation works in your site or something, and your whole site is in Perl CGI, they're hopeless. And the guys who can write big Perl programs could just as easily write C++ or Java programs. And you're not going to get them for 20 bucks an hour the way you can get a high school kid to help you with your website and recode 300 of your pages. So that's why this has sort of fallen by the way, wayside. Some big sites, um, notably Amazon, 
still run this way. That Obdias that's in every Amazon URL, Obdias is the mother of all Perl scripts. And all the things it does about tracking what books you like and what videos you might want to see that have just been released and everything. Perl can do that. But again, they, they took the hit of saying, well, we've got this sort of nasty program, but rewriting it is even more nasty, and well, it's the way it is. <laughs> Um, and they've mixed other things with it over, in with it over the years, but at, at its heart, Amazon is a big Perl CGI script, just to show you that the old way, it may not be the way they would do it if they started from today, but they never really die out, because someone wrote it that way and they don't want to throw it all out. Um, you're more limited with programs that are going to, people are going to request from your server and then they're going to run on the client side. The, the reason you're more limited is because, like I said, if you, if you give people who write websites infinite power to run, run whatever they want on everybody's client machines, some guys aren't going to be nice guys, and they're going to write something that runs on client machines that then trash them. So all the, all the methodologies that allowed this died out because people were advised, never run ActiveX controls on your, on your client because someone will trash your computer. So your really options are either JavaScript or VBScript, which are basically simple little programs you can use to add some interactivity to your web page that run within the web browser, or client-side Java, um, which will run inside the web browser, but again, it will introduce you to a world of hurt in that all of these have the disadvantage. The but on each of these is if everything runs on your server, um, any client, if the guy's coming to your website with a cell phone, a Palm Pilot, a Mac, a PC, anything, you don't care. You're displaying the output of your program to the client. It runs reliably because it doesn't depend on their browser doing anything but displaying HTML, which all browsers must do. The programs you write that run on the client's machine, the interactivity is nice, the things react immediately to when they click something, but now you're in a world where you really care. Do they have Firefox? Do they have Netscape version 7? Do they have IE? If it's IE, what subversion of IE is it? And the programs will run completely different depending on the clients. All the websites you people go to that won't run in Firefox, that you have to display it in IE for it to run right, the reason is they've used one of these type of technologies and they haven't tested it with Firefox because you have limited time. If they have IE on their desktop, they tested it with IE, it ran fine there, they released it onto the internet. Whereas if you really want to do this, what you end up with in your website is if AOL, run this code. If Unbroken Netscape, run this code. If Firefox, run this other code. If IE, go to this other program, if I e version this, run this code, and you really end up with a mess, and then you end up with someone whose full-time job it is to have 20 computers with different versions of browsers on each of the 20 computers, and run your website on each of the different computers, and make sure it displays right. And when I did e-commerce sites, this is very typical, because you need it to be interactive. Your users aren't all that motivated. You don't want them to click away to another site and go buy it there because your user interface stinks. But you also don't want to eliminate anyone who's eager to give you money because you don't support their browser. So one of our little hells was testing it on every sort of browser we could imagine that one of our users would use. Um, I did leave a lot out, like I said. Um, the first thing I left out was all the infrastructure you would need to actually run most of these type of programs. Um, web development, you could tell I sort of glossed over it. Um, systems programming languages, all the languages I went over are the type of programming languages you could write a web page or a little program for your own use or even a word processor in. If you were writing a factory automation system, an operating system kernel, a missile guidance system, anything like that. These are not the languages you would use, and there's a whole nother 
class of languages you would use for that. Um, I figured that would be of less interest to the general user. Um, teams of more than one person, that, that again is a whole another world um, and the whole business side of it. Um, the follow-up resource I listed here was one programmer's take on all those learn to be a programmer in 21 days books. Um, sort of a uh, sort of a neat site for anyone who wanted to follow up. I thought that was a, a good place to start. So that's it. So I'll open it up to questions. Are those links that you put in the presentation going to be available? <laughs> I hope that you've seen us the PowerPoint presentation. More big yes, I certainly I have it in PowerPoint. I saved it in HTML, but the HTML PowerPoint Windows version saves is a little nasty. So if you can eat a PowerPoint presentation, I will certainly send that to yeah, you. Yeah, because I can send it around. To a quick time movie. That's good. Uh, and I can change that. Then I can give him the quick time movie for him. Is that a dean that when you're a dean that thing there? You'll have the presentation tonight. So yes, the links will be all held. <laughs> Could write them down faster. <laughs> now it was it was my assumption when I when I put them in there that we would we would somehow get at least the links onto the web page. So but, uh, I was just curious. Missile guidance systems? What kind of languages <laughs> I mean military application programs, what are they what are they write in? Read don't you have haven't you ever no. visited the missile.org? No. <laughs> <laughs> so they're actually Be careful, you otherwise you might be uh, uh, knocking out Nagoya. <laughs> I was just curious. Anything that's that's very time dependent. Um, by time dependent, I mean something like, let's take something that flies, whether it's a missile or an airplane, or like in a factory, the big arms that swing buckets full of molten steel. Well, it, it very critically depends if something takes five seconds, or four seconds, and 59 milliseconds, or four seconds and 58 milliseconds, the result is very different. Because if you have to, say, spurt fuel into a jet engine, and you don't spurt enough fuel and the plane runs into the end of the runway instead of taking off, the fact that you spurt fuel a few seconds later doesn't help. <laughs> um, so more or less all the programs written that way um, are written in either C or Fortran currently. The, um, C was was again a response to a programmer's problem. The programmers r wrote these things in assembler code, but then every new computer they had to learn a new assembler code, and it was really annoying. So people got the idea: why don't I write an assembler code that will run on any computer? And that's really C is is it's very close to assembler code, but it will run more or less anywhere. And people people loved that because they could learn one language, and then new computer runs out, they can still use the same language, they didn't have to relearn it again. And particularly since it was very difficult to learn, this was a huge, huge benefit. But it still gives you the visibility into the actual hardware to say, no, this isn't going to happen three seconds from now, this is going to happen two seconds, 59 milliseconds, and eight nanoseconds from now, this will happen. And you can guarantee the sort of things where these higher level languages like Java, they're much more pleasant, but things sort of happen when they happen. Right. And if it's some human that you're interacting with, well, that's fine. There's no human alive who can tell whether it happened in three seconds or two seconds, 59 milliseconds. They don't know. So, you know, it happens in about three seconds from now is good enough. But sometimes if you're dealing with machinery and the gears have to mesh and so forth, that's not good enough and, well, <laughs> the environment's very different. So, I'm assuming that these, these like, machine languages are more, like, what? They're harder to work with, but they're just faster and more reliable? They give you more visibility into the actual workings of the computer okay. in the way that a Unix shell prompt gives you more visibility than a Mac OS X or a Windows interface. Oh, actually, what, uh, assembly language is scary because yeah. it tells you almost to the point of turn this switch on or turn this switch off or that was yeah. back to the old days when you had switches but now it's 
Yeah. You know, and this transistor turn this bit to one or turn this bit to zero or add this, take this bit and put it into the accumulator and put the accumulator uh, into something else. And so, you know, one line of Fortran, uh, maybe a hundred lines of assembly language. Uh, but, but in the assembly language, the advantage is if you need to know where, what wire is the electricity going to go down. I need the electricity to go down wire 3074. You can see that, and you can control it. And if it's an application where you need to control that, well, that's the price you pay. A programming language, uh, assembly language programmers rarely had hair because they usually had pulled it off. I used to be a, I used to be a chemical engineer that shared an office with the guy who was handling uh, a PDP-11 programming programming language to uh, assembly language to uh, control this uh, polyethylene plant that was producing uh, 15,000 pounds per hour. And I saw, I heard his screams of pain. <laughs> so it is not a fun thing. If, if he had written that in C, again, yeah. his life would have been a little bit easier, but not a whole lot. But he still could have controlled, okay, yeah. is it 390 Kelvins or 390.002 Kelvins? And well, he's got to know. <laughs> he's got to know how much electricity, he's got to know what temperature. If it gets too hot, he can't wait for his program to figure it out. He has to know right now that it's too hot. Shut the fire off, you know, whatever. Also, it's, you know, it's the type of thing, okay, if this happens, turn this valve. If that happens, turn this valve. And you get the valves wrong, you suddenly dump 20,000 pounds of polyethylene onto the ground. Uh, I had a question about shells, too. Like, mm -hmm. is there a way for, like, regular Windows users to access the shell and actually get in and start doing stuff? I mean, I Yes. Um, there's a program called Sigwin. Um, easy to download. And um, it's a uh, free software foundation, the same people who write all the GNU compilers. Um, and this is a, a complete Unix shell that runs on Windows. So right here we're in, I think, Bash Shell. But you also have uh, C Shell, all the other Unix shell varieties available to you in Sigwin. It doesn't quite hide the fact that you're in Windows, but it is pretty close to being at a Linux prompt. Um, the environment is as Linux-like as they can make it within the constraints of Windows. So you can do shell scripts. Um, what I tend to use it for is for instance, this is the environment I expose to all my Perl scripts because all my servers run Linux and I don't want my scripts to be used to the Windows environment where I code them and then I move them over to Linux and I find all sorts of brokenness. So by running them in this environment, it's close enough so that if it runs here, it'll probably run there. Um, so it's sort of a close enough Unix environment for Linux. Um, and it is pretty... Uh, let me see if I can find it quickly here. Yeah. See, it, it's uh, sources.redhat.com sigwin. And it has a Windows installer or a Mac installer. Although, with OS X, you really don't need the Mac installer because you've got all the shells built in. But it will still run on there if you should, for some reason, desire it. Um, and it lets you choose, you know, what you want to install. Typically, that might be pretty cool to show a little package selection screen. Just just gamble on it. Sure. The candy store. Exactly. Now, these are. Um, Okay, so what this basically is, is a list of all the programs it has up on the web server that I could download into Sigwin. Now, the nice thing for a Windows user is you can get a lot of, um, a lot of Unix programs without having a separate Linux machine. 
So here you can see all the programs I have installed. Shells. So I have Ash, Bash, Bash Completion, I have C shells, I have T shell, I have Z shell. It's um, it's a a more limited selection than than if you had installed a a Linux machine, but a, a vastly larger selection than you can get that will actually run on Windows natively. Um, for instance, databases. There's hundreds of databases for Linux. Um, not so many free ones for Windows. Um, Sleepy Cat is currently the, the free database from uh, the Free Software Foundation. People from Berkeley wrote it. Um, Postgres is a big object oriented <coughs> database. A uh, lot of power, not so quick. MySQL is, is a third free database. I have all three of those databases installed in my little Sigwin environment. Now, I could probably get two out of three running on Windows, but the environment would be different enough that if I wrote anything that depended on Postgres being a certain way or MySQL being a certain way, when I then actually moved it onto a server with that database actually running in Linux, it would all be broken. Whereas if it, I, I'm using the same version here because it thinks it's running on Linux, um, it's closer. Um, so, where, where do you think the future is going for the programming languages? Do you think it's a sort of Windows way or a Linux way or Windows? It, it really is for running local graphics pro graphical user interface programs. Um, Windows really hasn't lost much steam. Um, it's still very easy to write the programs. It's the largest market to sell them into, so anyone who's writing them will, of course, think, well, if I'm going to release, the thing I'm going to release first is where 85% of my users are. So in that market, the whole Microsoft environment is very strong. Um, as far as the server market, that's very hotly contested. Um, and there's really no clear advantages. I mean, if I was going to write a web, web page, to be honest, if it was me and I was had a, a blank sheet of paper, whether I did it in Java plus HTML to JSP or PHP would depend on how large I anticipated the website becoming. Um, the Java's a bit more work to set up. Um, bit more work to maintain, bit more capability. Um, so if, I, if it was the type of site where it would grow with the business and I might want the site to get awfully large and complex, I would probably start in Java. If it was something you know, like a personal site that I wanted to have a password protect area where I could put family pictures and stuff and I didn't want them to be exposed to the world and I wanted to you know, have a few features, log in, maybe even a site that was going to run a small business, but I, the business wasn't focused around the site, I'd probably start it off in PHP. But if my network admins at whatever company were more comfortable with Windows, I might do ASP just because it's easier than retraining all the admins would be to code it in a different site. There's, there's really no... Now, if I were to compare you know, any of those ways of doing it to, say, using Perl CGI or coding my web page in C, which I've seen, um, I would have to have a real good reason to go over to an entirely different class of technology. I would have to have a fantastically strong reason to code a site all in Flash. Now, a lot of people do it. Flash is an easy language to learn. But if I ever want to get into the world where um, reliability matters, security matters, um, performance matters, and I've coded the site in Flash, I'm screwed. <laughs> oh, am I screwed? And, well, you know, it's just a personal thing, but any technology where I'll have to throw away the whole site, <laughs> ever, um, to me is, is a bad technology because as, as a programmer, if I ever have to go to my you know, business guys and say, well, you know that two years work we did? Well, we sort of have to toss that in the bin. 
and start from scratch. Um, if I have a good relationship, I've damaged my credibility, and I'll go do that, and afterwards they may or may not forgive me, depending on how the project goes. If I don't have a good relationship, I've just gone to my boss and said, I need to be fired right now because I'm an idiot. <laughs> Whether or not I am, you know. So I have a built-in bias against anything that's not extendable. And what the, what the technologies I sort of presented have in common is no matter which one you choose, you can always back out gracefully. If I have a site that runs in PHP and I say, you know, I really don't have enough power here and I want to add in a little bit of Perl or a little bit of Java. It's not as clean as if I'd started out that way. It'll be harder to maintain that because then all my programmers will need to know PHP plus Java, right? But it won't be technically impossible. I can be running them on the same server and they won't fight with each other. Oh, that's what I was going to ask. You could have different uh, program languages running on the same server and not conflicting. Right. And I mean, even, even to the point where now, if I'm running a, a Windows program, I can start it off in VB and then halfway through write some parts of it in C-sharp if, if I needed more power. And again, would I want to do that deliberately to myself? No, because now I have to know two programming languages and more importantly, while I'm working on the program, I have to be able to switch back and forth between two programming languages, which is difficult just like switching back and forth between Japanese and English is harder than just talking in English or just talking in Japanese. Mm -hmm. When you have to switch back and forth, you end up you know, looking at someone who doesn't understand any Japanese and then speaking in Japanese and talking back to someone who understands English. and you know, it, it all bollocks up in your, your head. The same thing happens with programming languages. If you have to switch, mm -hmm. you end up making more mistakes because you're, you're still thinking in VB and you're on the page where you have to be coding in C-sharp, but... Have, have there been efforts to uh, connect any of these languages by translation? Like, you know, all over the world we're translating German to English and English into Japanese. Is there any... What, what, what they typically are doing is the modern environments are going more, to, more and more to not caring what language you started in. So, for instance, it used to be the case that if I coded something in VB, and I had to add some C++. C Sharp is a newer development. What I really was doing was calling a completely separate program. And that would never be hidden from me as a programmer. Like I couldn't, I couldn't call just a function that I'd written in another language. It would be, I have to invoke a separate program through a DLL that I've written in another language. Now, what Microsoft has done in their newer programming environments is they, they've standardized things to the point where if I have a, a function written in one language and a function written in another, as long as I know how to call the function, I really don't care what it's written in in the inside. I, as a user, don't care. Um, and in fact, when I made my little example program, the fact that I would type the name of something, then click a dot, and it provided me a list of all the different things I could do. What I was doing was calling an object that's probably not written in C sharp. It's probably written in C or C++ because it's part of Windows, right? The, the code that makes buttons work is not, is not high-level code. It's, it's operating system-level code. They want it to be very quick, so they've written all that in C++. But I don't need to know C++ to call that, right? All I need to know is the name and the fact that it expects a string of text. And when I pass it a string of text, it displays it in the box. Well, I really don't care the mechanics behind that. Um, so that, that's sort of the direction they're going with modern environments is once you have something written, you don't care what's inside it. Now, in the Perl Unix world, um, Java world, they're a bit behind. They're trying to catch up, but they've, they've run into some, some issues. The, the next versions of Perl, PHP, Java will be friendlier to each other. Um, but currently, you have a Java virtual machine that runs Java. If a Perl virtual machine that in the current version of Perl is sort of built into the language, it's not really even a clean virtual machine. You have a Python interpreter that um, there's a whole bunch of open source projects that are 
aimed at solving this problem because because of this. I really shouldn't care. Now, especially I shouldn't care because, as I said, Perl is sort of a messy language to code in, but there's a tremendous number of great programs written in Perl for um, doing stuff to web pages, for interpreting M MP3 files. If I want to go and, and write a program that checks that all the uh, tags in my MP3 files and the file names match, so that if I have an a artist and a and a uh, song name in, in my file name and I want to check it against the artist and the song name and make sure that they're the same, um, I can write that in Perl very quickly because someone's written all the nasty stuff that actually goes to the innards of the MP3 files and reads the tags and all that crap that I don't want to spend a Saturday afternoon writing has already been written for me. But let's say I want to write my script in Python because I'm a neat person and I don't want to write a messy script. Well, that's not currently possible. And they would really like it to be. Because again, you've got all these pieces laying there. It doesn't make any sense that I have to write in the same language as the person who wrote the piece to use his piece. But that's the way, the way it currently is over there. This is a little bit probably off topic, but if we were going to write a game program, and I don't mean an interve internet based game, yeah, I mean a game, a game, game, game running off of this, what would you say would be the best language to use? Best is hard, I can tell you most common. Um, and I'll, I'll get to this. Um, games, like other local user interface programs, are complicated. Mm -hmm. So you want to use an object oriented language so you can break it up into little pieces. Mm -hmm. But games also have the aspect of like a missile guidance system that you care about speed. Mm -hmm. And as, as a gamer yourself, you'll know that one of the things gamers look at is like the frame rate mm -hmm. of the video. And, and they really care if the video is slow and kludgy and it glitches. Um, so the sort of compromise between these two worlds is a language called C++. Mm -hmm. And it's an object-oriented version of C. So you have that low level, okay, I like wire 97 on the graphics card type of control, but you still have the object oriented aspect of it. C++ is sort of, um, the best description I've heard is it's like a chainsaw. So it's like a chainsaw in that I've got all this power and I can cut through things. But it's like a chainsaw, it's got no off switch. It's got no guards. I gotta be real careful, or my leg is one of those things I can cut. Um, Not a finesse. Because I've got all this power. I've got this power of object-oriented languages. I've got this low-level power of C. I've got all this power laying there, and I've got nothing like Java. Like I said, was designed from the start to be very safe, to make it easy to write reliable programs. C++ was designed from the start to allow you to do whatever you want to do. So if you don't have the internal discipline to write things carefully and be spot on with what you're doing, you can make horrible, horrible things happen very easily. And I've seen, you know, just horrible things. And, but I mean, that's currently the most popular language for writing games, is C++ still. Um, because of that, because they're sort of in a, in a rock and a hard place. Like, a game is too complicated really to write in C, but it's too speed dependent to write in Java or C sharp. So they're sort of. You meant, uh, again, possibly a bit off topic, but you mentioned about uh, that checking the books on Amazon.com and Amazon in Japan. Is, is that because it's the, the shipping price is cheaper, or why would you do that? Um, I found. For, for me, if, if I'm going to buy a book here in yeah. English, yeah. if Amazon Japan has it, by the time I'm done, it'll come to me quicker and cheaper yeah. if I buy it from Amazon Japan. Of course. But there will be some books that they just won't have. So yeah. I'll have to order it from Amazon US and pay the international shipping yeah. and get it to me. So I preferentially go to Amazon Japan. Yeah. But the Amazon Japan um, context sensitive book search engine that lets you find a book when you enter a snip of the author's name or whatever, yeah. um, doesn't work right in English. I can, I can type the complete title of a book, it'll say I have no such book, 
I type in the ISBN number and it finds the book. Yeah. So the pages used to be linked. You could use the English American search engine and then you could uh, find the page and then just change it to uh, like CODJP and it would like link automatically to the same page yeah. on the Japanese site. I mean, that's sort of how the script works. It, it depends on the structure of the URL, but it just does it en masse. So that does work. It, it usually works, yeah. It, it usually works, and the reason it usually works is because the ISBN number is coded into the URL. It's part of how that works. Yeah. So if you just change it, now, the, the thing I'll, I'll warn everyone about Amazon is they fiddle with things. So if they fiddle with not only the layout of the pages, but the layout of the URLs, at least once a week. So the the reason I ended up writing a script is because I got frustrated. And, and, and it's if there's anything you depend on about Amazon, it'll change. So if you code something that depends on things working the same instead of looking the same, you're pretty well you're 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 pretty well off because the programmers are going to change that aspect of it the minimum they can. Like the business guys are going to say, change everything, change everything. They're going to change how things actually work the minimum they can because that's hard work for them, right? They've got it working now. They don't want to really. So if it's anything that depends on how it works, that changes once every year or two. If it's anything that depends on how it looks every three days. I mean, like when I drag the drag the shortcut for the book, um, my first version of this just was a renamer. Like the renamer I showed you, it was a simple renamer that depended on how the pieces of the title, where it put Amazon.com dash book, so I would know, okay, I go over two dashes, then I get to the actual title of the book. Then I, well, I was rewriting that renamer every four days because they would they would change the dash to a colon, and then they would take the spaces out. Then they would make it capitals. Then they would make it lower thing. And I got so aggravated, I said, okay. And I looked at the internal structure of the pages, and that turned out to be consistent, because again, they can change how it looks without changing the internal structure. And programmers being you know, your typical employee are going, okay, how can I make it look the way my boss just told me while doing the absolute minimum amount of effort <laughs> humanly <laughs> possible? So they changed that much less, so that, that, that sort of kind of like throwing a wrench into today's uh, topic in a way, but uh, I got this nephew programmer living in California with a boat and a pool and a half million dollar house, and he says he knows 16 languages, but he only programs in Visual Basic. He says he uses that for everything. Mm -hmm. Is he crazy? I mean, not crazy. It's actually typical because it's a lot less effort to learn a specific tool than to learn the way things work and then pick up a number of tools to do it. So like I said, if you're doing a certain type of thing, Visual Basic will be very good. And as long as your business is centered around that type of thing, uh -huh, um, you're all good. If you have to do some different type of thing, you can probably still do it in Visual Basic. It will just be very painful. So be painful to write or slow to run? Painful to write, slow to run. It'll the, the result won't show your effort. Right? So now the key, if, if you're a Visual Basic guy, is to know I only work in a Microsoft environment. So if anyone wants this stuff to run in Linux, I don't take the job. Right. I only do graphical programs. I don't do big bash programs. So if it's an insurance company, I don't take the job. A little mom and pop, sure, fine, I'll take yeah, the job. Yeah, you got a lot of small businesses. Because small businesses, again, if I misapply Visual Basic and I make it process text files, well, until they're a certain size, it'll work okay, right? But if I get, like, all the visa statements that have to be processed worldwide for March, that's beyond that size. I put that into Visual Basic, it won't finish by the time April rolls around. But if I get all the visa statements for Fred's Shoes in Anaheim, Probably it will get through it, and, and maybe it'll get through it in an hour instead of 15 minutes, but no one really cares, you know. Do you close it down your notebook? No, no I, I, I just... just for cookies. Just throw them all. So I think we're going to take a little break, and I think a lot of people are starting to go to the bathroom, so...
Let's take a five minute break and then come back and watch Ernie's iPod video. Cool. For now, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff.